Uh, we're continuing our series, 40 Days in the, in the Word, um, and it's been a good series for us. I hope it's been helpful to you, and we have several weeks of the series to go. Um, I'm hoping you're taking advantage of some of the video material that's available at 40, day, 40 days in the Word.com. Uh, there's daily devotionals that fill in a lot of extra pieces that we cannot cover um, during our message series. So I hope that you'll take some time to look at some of those. Uh, this morning, if you brought a Bible in some form, if you turn to Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, we're going to be using this text as we talk today about how, how to study a Bible passage. Uh, I think there's... Uh, Questions that we generally ask to uh, before we make big decisions, uh, we realize the importance of questions. Say, for instance, if you are um, deciding whether to take a job or not, uh, you're going to ask some questions. Now, what would some of those questions be? Okay, what are the hours? Day, night, how many hours a week? How much money? Yeah, obviously, uh, as I said early in the, f in the first service, how much money in a family feud game would have been at the very top of the list, probably, uh, that most people would say that. So, yeah, how, how much am I going to be paid? What else? Details of the job. Some kind of a job description. What am I going to be doing? That kind of thing. How am I going to be measured? How much vacation time do I have? How do I accrue that? Um, you know, do I start out with how much and, you know, is there any the first year, is there not any the first year, that type of thing. Okay, other things. Insurance. I'm sorry, I can't hear everything all at once, but insurance, uh, you know, it's health insurance, vision, dental, exactly what is offered uh, with this particular job and, and how soon does the insurance kick in, you know, with different companies that you have to be there 30 days or 60 days or whatever it is, maybe start immediately with insurance. Something over here. How stressful. Yeah, you got to think about the job, what it requires. Uh, is this something I can handle? Retirement. Is there some, some plans for retirement? Do I have a 401k? Is there matching funds? Do, you know, exactly, is there a pension? What, it, what exactly, how is this set up for, for me? Other things. Location. Sorry? Location. Location. How far is it from where I live? Um, you know, can I work from home or do I have to come into the workplace? You know, those are kinds of questions sometimes we ask. Other things? Advancement. Yeah, is there opportunity for advancement? I mean, when, as I'm here, am I always going to be doing this? Or will there be opportunities to move up into other positions uh, as I get comfortable with those and want to want to give those some kind of an attempt? Um, when do you need me to start? You know, is it going to be two weeks or, you know, is this a job they want you immediately? And if you're working somewhere else, can you navigate that with, with uh, where you're currently working? How often will I be paid? You know, do I get paid every week, every two weeks, once a month? Um, how long has this company been in existence? You know, is this a long-term thing or is this one of them fly-by-night companies? I'm going to take a job there and, you know, they've been in 12 different locations in 12 states and this is just the latest uh, place that they are. You know, even if you're desperate, you're in that position where you're so desperate, you're just, you think you would take any job that came along because you're that desperate. Even, even in those situations, you realize the importance of asking some questions because this is where you're going to spend 40 hours plus or minus a week of your life. And is this something you want to do? You know, it, it may be the worst thing you've ever done in your life to take this job, even if you are desperate. And sometimes we just have to, uh, but we're always eyeballing something else as soon as it's available. But I think we ask questions. We ask good questions. It doesn't matter what you're trying to decide. If, it's, if you're trying to decide which school to, to enroll your child, if you're thinking about where you want to go for your doctor or your dentist or where you want to bank or, you know... If you're single, whom should I date? You know, um, what car should I buy? You know, there's just questions that you you realize you have to ask these questions. They're they're a basis of a decision, and they're important. And so you, we learn the key of asking good questions. And I want you to understand today that the same thing is true of understanding the Bible. To understand it and have it transform you is to learn to ask good questions. Ask good questions. Now, I understand that there's many people that don't know what those good questions are. 
you know, you're sitting there right now. Maybe you can think, well, I can think of a few questions, but what are those questions that I'm supposed to ask? We're going to talk about those today. There are four questions that you should ask anytime you study the Bible, and that, that will be the basis of what we're looking at today. But we want to look at the importance of good questions in Bible study using Philippians chapter 2, 19 to 30. So this is a particular text that we're going to use as our example today. And I want to talk to you a little bit first about some background, because I think this is important when you study the Bible um, to have some idea of why, what is the purpose of this portion of Scripture. We realize as we look at this, this is a letter. The book of Philippians is a letter. Uh, we know who wrote it. Um, so that kind of thing is pretty generally known. So we know this is going to be straightforward. It's not like some um, mysterious information here like we might find a little bit in Revelation or the book of Ezekiel or Daniel. There's not these uh, kind of veiled language kind of things that, that make this a little more difficult to understand. Uh, it's not a prophetic book where you have to kind of stop and think as who is this talking about and is this future, past, what exactly is going on here. So we're talking about a letter, the book of Philippians. And, you know, to gain your background for books of the, the Bible, um, you can, a lot of you have Bibles that have this in the back. Now, not all of you, but if you've got some study helps in your Bible, sometimes in the back you will find a summary of the various books of the Bible. Uh, one of the Bibles I use has those listed in the back. They're very short, like a paragraph, a few sentences. But, you know, that's really helpful uh, to kind of give you the context, when was this written? Why was it written? Who wrote it? So forth. Um, if you don't have it in your Bible, there's other places that you can look for it. Uh, some people turn to Bible commentaries, uh, dictionaries. Um, those type of things can provide very good summaries. Haley's Bible Handbook I grew up with. Uh, it's just a great, great book resource uh, for things like this. A lot of people don't have these resources, but the beautiful thing today is all you have to do is go on the internet. <laughs> you know, you can go on the internet and there's tons of Bible study resources. I, I like to use, uh, I've got a program that I had to pay for, but I've also like things like BibleGateway.com are excellent, crosswalk.com. There's just a lot of different resources there that you can use today to help you gain some background in a portion of the Bible that you're trying to study that you want to know more about. In the book of Philippians, we know that Paul is writing a letter from Rome where he is a prisoner. Uh, he's in prison because of his, his sharing of Jesus, and he's waiting for his trial before the Roman emperor Caesar, and where he will either, when he is there, he'll either be um, set free or he'll be executed. That's just kind of the way it worked out. In the ancient world, you never wanted to go to prison because when you got locked up, they didn't feed you or give you water. Um, this wasn't something they provided. They tried to make this as awful as they could. I've read of some places where a sewer ran through the prison. So uh, it's just not a great place to be. But you were dependent on somebody from the outside, often known as a benefactor, someone that would bring you water every day, would bring you food when you, it was time to eat. And you were dependent on these people. There were people that went to jail in the ancient world that died of starvation before they ever got to trial because they didn't have somebody on the outside that could take care of them. And I don't I don't think those who ran the prisons really cared one way or the other. Um, that's just the way it was. Very different than prisons today. <clears throat> but Paul is in prison in Rome, and this church in Asia Minor, or modern day Greece, is providing resources for him while he's waiting for trial. They have sent money uh, through couple of messengers that are there and they are taking care of Paul. This church is taking care of him. And Paul is so grateful um, because they have not only sent the resources, but they have sent people to help take care of his needs. And Paul in this letter is writing a thank you note, more or less, and he calls this letter Philippians because the city where the church was, was the city of Philippi. You know, if Paul, you know, was writing this letter to us today, he might call it Louisvillians or something like that. You know, and it, it would be, our name would be up there at the top. But we realize he's writing to people in Philippi. He calls it Philippians. 
And Paul tells them in the letter that he wants to send the helpers back to them because there was some concern for at least one of them. And they need, he wants them to go home. They've been with him for a while, knows they've been away for a while. And um, he wants to send these two guys back. But before he does, he wants to tell the church how wonderful these two individuals have been to him. So we pick up in Philippians chapter 2, a little bit of background now, and we're going to begin reading in, in verse 19 of this text. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. I think it's easy for any of us to to read through this passage, maybe it's because your class is working on it and you're all looking at different chapters in the book of Philippians or, or maybe you're just sitting down to read and you decide there's some good stuff in Philippians so you want to read through the book. I think it's really easy to read this passage about these people that you maybe have heard of, maybe you haven't and you don't really know the whole story about it and you wonder why is this passage any, have any significance for me at all? I mean, it's about people I don't, I don't really know and a place I don't know and it's a long time ago. And, you know, what's so significant about this? Why did God record this? And how is this significant to my life on October the 4th, 2015 in Louisville, Kentucky? What exactly does God have in mind for this? Well, you know, when I start wondering questions like that, it doesn't matter what part of the Bible you're in, and it's so easy to think, oh, this didn't have anything to do with me. I don't understand this anyway. Let's skip this part and go on to something I do understand. I mean, when we go through times like it, it's important to remember two scriptures. The first is one we looked at several weeks ago in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where Paul wrote, all scripture is inspired by God. And is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. It's helpful at times when you begin to ask those questions mentally or out loud that every single scripture in the word of God is inspired of God. There, he put it there for a reason. And it's there and it's useful to teach us and to help us. And then over in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, he wrote to the church in Rome, for everything that is written in the past was written to teach us. The word of God, every part of it, God means for your benefit. And just because there's parts you don't understand doesn't mean you're supposed to just quit on those passages and say, nothing there for me. So when we skip over a Bible passage or 
and think it's just insignificant to us, it really doesn't apply to us, if we just continue to do that through the Bible, we're going to miss out on something very significant that God intends for you. Until you dig a little bit, you really don't know what that is. And so today we're going to look at our passage through four important questions. And today I just want you to realize as we've shared each week that this is a series put together by Rick Warren at the Saddleback Church and much of the content of this message is from some of Rick's uh, message material. The first point on your outline today as we look at that is the, uh, the understanding of we need observation and, other, and the question that goes along with that is what does it say? As I generally observe this passage of Scripture, Philippians chapter 2, 19 to 30, what does it say? And this is where you kind of not just read it and think in your mind. The difference between Bible reading and Bible study is in your Bible, just the reading, you just go through it and you, you read it. When you're doing study, you're probably going to have to get at your pen or pencil. You're going to have to start typing a few things because there's some things you're going to compile so that you can understand better. So what you're doing here in this first step of observation is you're saying, what generally does this passage say? You're not trying to interpret it. You're not trying to figure out the meaning of it. At this point, you're just trying to say, what is it saying? And so you begin reading again. You begin jotting down a few things. As we look at this passage, we know, first of all, that Paul wants to send these two guys back to Philippi, okay? You know, it's pretty obvious as you read through it, just a general observation. Verse 19, as you look at the text, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy back to you soon. And then over in verse 25, he says, but I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. So he's got in his heart this desire. He wants these two guys to go back to Philippi for some important reasons. And secondly, we know as we read through there that Paul wants everyone to know that these two guys have been a very significant help to him in a, in a lot of rough times. He says of Timothy in verse 20, I have no one else like him. Wow. Makes him pretty special. He goes on to say about Epaphroditus in verse 29, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. Again, we, we know that Paul wants to send these men back to Philippi and he wants these two individuals to be greatly honored. They have done things that deserve great honor in the eyes of Paul. They've been that much of a help. Well, a third observation as you look at this is why does Paul say this about these guys? Does he mention somewhere in this text why these guys are supposed to be so honored? Well, yeah, he does. He says about Timothy in verse 20, he takes a genuine interest in your welfare. And in verse 22, he says that Timothy has proved himself. And then in regard to Epaphroditus, Paul calls him my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. And in verse 30, he says he almost died for the, for the work of Christ, risking his life. Wow. These guys have accomplished some things, and, and Paul is pointing those out. So as we look to this text, maybe you would see other things. We're just kind of pulling out some things as we talk about this today. But you're just making general observations. What do you see? You jot it down, the first step you've, you've accomplished. What's next? The second thing is interpretation. You ask the question, what does the text mean? What exactly does, is being shared here? that we need to understand. People often ask, doesn't the Bible mean what it says? And the important thing is, no, the Bible means what it means. It means what it means, and there is a difference. Because context is always important in the understanding of the Bible. I get in discussions with people every once in a while that want to pull something out of context and make a point about it. And that's not how the Bible is to be interpreted. Context is always important in the study of God's Word. For instance, if I mention to you the word pin, P-I-N, your mind will maybe immediately go to some picture of what a pin is for you, okay? Maybe you think I'm talking about a rolling pin. 
You know, some of you like to bake. Well, maybe, I don't know if there's any. There's some of you that do. You know, are you thinking the next time your husband steps out of line, he's getting one of those, you know, rolling pin. You're thinking about a rolling pin. You know, when I say pin, some of you might be thinking about a bowling pin. You like to bowl, you know, you're, you're pretty good at it. And you think immediately bowling pins or maybe your child or grandchild went to a party and they pinned the tail on the donkey. They played that old game. Maybe they still do that. I don't know. But you know the word pen has over 60 different meanings. So you can all be sitting there. In this group this size today, there could be 30, 40 different understandings of the word. Maybe I'm, I'm giving you a lot of credit here. I don't know. Uh, of of your, your mental thought of what I'm talking about when I talk about pen. But without context, you have no idea. You can say, well, you're meaning this. I know you mean this because that's what I'm thinking. And you could try to push that on me. But until I tell you that I'm talking about wrestling, and all of a sudden you think of someone being pinned and losing the match, then you understand what I'm talking about. I've given you context. And now you understand which form, expression of pin that I'm talking about. And the same thing's true of the Bible. When you start looking at in words and phrases in the Bible, you have to look at the context. What is being talked about here that gives this passage the meaning that the Bible is intending to express? As we look at this passage, we see that it gives us some characteristics of these two men. But because they are so applauded by Paul and so honored, and, and he just pushes these, these fellows up to the top and says, you should honor these people, he expresses within this text some things that make them worthy of being honored. And because this is true, this means that there are some things being expressed here that you and I should be seeking to exhibit as well. For instance, let's look at a few of these. Paul says about Timothy in verses 20 to 21, as you look at the text, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests. Now, I know you're shocked that there were people way back then that actually put their own needs ahead of others. I mean, you know, that doesn't happen today. Are y'all awake this morning? Okay, I'm just checking. But here is Timothy, and Timothy is actually, he's one of these people. He cares about other people more than himself. And Paul's saying, I don't run across a whole lot of these people. And you're probably sitting here thinking, I don't run across a whole lot of these people. But here, he's holding up Timothy as someone who cares more about himself or, or for others than himself. And people like Timothy realize other people matter. Other people love. They need love. They need kindness. They need attention. They need thoughtfulness. They need somebody to listen to them. They need somebody to care about them without necessarily judging them and drawing conclusions. And so he says, first of all, godly people care like Timothy. In verse 22, he says that Timothy has proved himself. And we know from this that a godly person, first of all, is, or second of all, is consistent. Timothy has been with Paul in every type of, type of circumstance. They have been all over uh, the Mediterranean Sea area, and, and they've known what it is to be hungry and what it is to be well-fed, what it is to be cold, what it is to be hot, what it is to be persecuted, what it is to be comforted. And he knows that in all of these situations, Timothy has been consistent. His actions and his words match. He is not a chameleon who is changing his identity with every different group of people that he is with. He is the same regardless of who he's with. He had proven himself to Paul. You and I are called upon occasionally to prove ourselves to someone so that we can move into a situation. For instance, when you're dating someone, you're seeking to prove yourself. You're proving himself to them, maybe to their children, maybe to their parents, depending on what season of life that you are in. But you are, you are over time proving yourself to be something 
good or bad. So with you, I'm sure it'd be good. If you're being considered to teach a class at church or, or some community setting, you have to prove yourself. I mean, what are, your, what are your references? What is your experience? Can we see something that you have done? Can we watch and hear you teach a class? Or say, for instance, you're being considered for a job at work or as an elder or deacon or a leader in the church. There's, there's some proving that we go through. And we learn about people over time as we are with them by observing them in the various situations that we find them. Situations that are scripted that they could prepare for. Situations that are not scripted that they could not prepare for. And people prove themselves over time in one way or another. So a godly person is consistent. A third characteristic that Paul points out of a godly person is in verse 25. And in essence he says there in that verse is that Epaphroditus was cooperative. He described him as my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. All of those terms speak to a working together situation. This is a person who you can work with. You know, you and I live in a Frank Sinatra culture. My way. I did it my way. You know, that's held up as something greatly worthy, that you are so independent that you don't need anybody else. You did it all yourself. Aren't you proud of yourself? You know, that is just thrown at us in every turn. And there's nothing wrong with being all that God created you to be, striving to, to be what God has made you to be, using your abilities, taking your experiences, and, and molding them into be what God created you to be. But none of us is an island where we can claim every success is just our own making. We are all dependent on other people to be who we are. And shame on us when we forget that. But Epaphroditus was a team player. He could serve alongside others rather than having to be the one who serves over people. He was cooperative. A fourth characteristic of a godly person is found in verse 26. When Epaphroditus' Christian brothers and sisters back home heard how sick he was, they kept sending letters trying to find out how he was doing. Now, you and I do that some today. You know, somebody we hear is ill, we get on the phone, we call them up, or maybe you take something over, depending on what their illness is, or they come home from surgery, and you take food over to them, or your class does. I mean, all those are wonderful things that we do to show our concern. But they didn't have phones back then, so they had to write letters. And letters moved slow, and answers came back slowly, and there were a lot of gaps in between information that they had, but they knew Epaphroditus was sick, and then they heard he was really sick, and then they heard he was near death and they are just so distressed and, and concerned and worried about Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus was being stressed because they were so stressed. He didn't want to be a burden to them. He went to help Paul and now in, the, and in a way he's trying to help but he's so sick he can't provide all the help he was sent to do and, and he's, he's concerned that he's not meeting muster here and, and he's distressed for those back home. And we learn that a godly person is considered of, of others. But the fifth characteristic is seen in verses 27 to 30, where Paul writes about Epaphroditus. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, verse 27, and then verse 30, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Paul almost gave, uh, Paul, I'm sorry, Epaphroditus almost gave up his life for the cause of Christ. He's, he's left everything he has behind to take resources to a prison in Rome to minister to Paul. He's made a huge sacrifice. He's gotten sick. And he almost gave up his life for the cause of Christ. This is a person that is sold out to a cause that's bigger than him. A godly person, we learn to honor, is courageous enough to sacrifice everything, anything, for the cause of Christ. The question I think you and I have to ask as we read through, there are many, but one of them is, is your commitment to Christ deep enough to cause you to risk everything for it? 
Or is ours just a convenient faith? Well, that'd be easy enough. I'll do that. That ain't going to cost me anything. I'll do that. What, what type of faith do we have? What kind of commitment do we have? Are we courageous enough to put anything and everything we have on the line for the cause of Christ? Epaphroditus was a godly man so in love with the kingdom of God that he was willing to place his life on the altar if it meant the kingdom would advance. Is that your faith? Is that mine? Okay, we'd never seen those things if we hadn't dug through the Bible text a little bit. You know, if we hadn't taken those steps of observation and, and then interpretation, we, we would have probably blown right past it and not seen that there's wonderful individuals here and... And Paul is saying these are people worthy of being honored. And these are things that you and I need to look at our own lives and say, do those things exist? Let's move on to the third step quickly, and that is correlation. What other verses help explain this text? You know, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. You use the Bible to explain the Bible. A principle of interpretation you learn in school or things you read is to interpret a un an un I'm sorry, an unclear passage with one that is more clear. If you read something in the Bible that doesn't make sense, find a parallel verse that might be clear and use that to help you better understand the Bible. Use what's clear to explain what's unclear. Because if you don't, you'll come to a passage and say, I think it means this, just off the top of your head, but it doesn't mean that at all. There's some things that the Bible means. There's some things the Bible definitely doesn't mean. And that's why you and I need to know that the only way we're going to understand is to really look at things in the context of the whole Bible. What does it say? Does it fit in the parameters of what the Bible teaches? You know, we're blessed today to have many Bibles that give cross-references. Some of you have them down the center of your Bible, down through the text. Some of you have them off to the side. Some of you have none at all, okay? But uh, if you're, you're blessed if you have a Bible that has cross-references because if it's verse 19, you just look over in that column and it'll say verse 19. It'll give you a verse or two or three verses. And you can look at those and it will show you how this particular uh, meaning of this text is used in other places. And so you can use correlation. You can look at related passages and, and, and understand things better. Perhaps you want to learn what the Bible teaches about Epaphroditus. You know, you've never really studied him before. Or, or maybe you're interested in Timothy and what kind of person that he was. Or maybe you want to know more about courage because you're not a very courageous person. And so it's easy enough for you to go to the index, which is often in the back of your Bible. Or a concordance that's often in the back of your Bible. Or there's ones that you can purchase. Or again, you can go online and find these wonderful resources. And, and, and these this index or concordance is just simply a list of references of names and people and places where, where they appear in the Bible. And you can open up a concordance or an index and see every place that the name Epaphroditus is mentioned. And you can see that his name is mentioned three times. And you can look at each of those and you can learn more about Epaphroditus. You can look up courage and, and every place in the Bible where the word courage is used, you can understand and grow in what the Bible says to us about courage. But correlation is where you see how this word is used in other Bible passages. And again, you're just broadening your understanding of the meaning of what's going on so that you can learn and apply it. And that is the fourth step, application. What do I need to change? What do I need to change? Notice that application is last on our list. And it's the main thing that people want to know. Everybody wants the shortcut, you know. You come to the Bible, you want answers about something. So how does this help my marriage? How does this help my finances? How does this help me get along with my kids? I mean, they're looking for something they can apply immediately. And uh, certainly God has a word on all these things and more. I understand that. I'm a human being as well. But the problem is if we start with application and we miss the steps before it, sometimes we apply the Bible in the wrong way. We wrongly apply the Bible when we choose to take a passage out of its context so that it meets our needs. I mentioned that earlier in some discussions that I have with people. 
Uh, they just don't want to consider context. They just want to pull verses and say the Bible says this. And I keep saying context. And they're like, no, the Bible says this. I see you got to look at context. No, you know, you kind of get in these arguments that are just going around in circles with people because they don't care about context. But it's important. And I think you and I have probably done this at times. When we want to go to the Bible and find some justification for why we do or don't do this, you know, we, we're, we're looking. We're looking for something that we can hang our hat on and say, see, I don't have to do this. Or, you know, I need to do this because this is what the Bible says. And probably we've all been guilty of that at some time or another. And the reason we go through observation and interpretation and correlation in Bible study is that when we arrive at application... We know we're applying what God wants us to apply. I love what Rick Warren said, and you've got to kind of look at this and think about it a little bit. But he wrote, you only believe the parts of the Bible you actually do. It's not enough to study the Bible. Study is not enough. Study will give you a big brain, little heart. You've got to do it. You only believe the parts of the Bible you actually do. Think about that one. Because I think it says something about us as people. You only believe the parts of the Bible you actually do. Study is not enough. You've got to apply it. You've got to do it. And so when we read a passage like Philippians 2, 19-30... What is the Holy Spirit calling you to do in this passage? Is there something you need to start or stop doing? Is there an attitude that you have that is hurting important relationships in your life? Are we striving, as this passage says, to be more caring, more consistent, more cooperative, more considerate, more courageous? Are you growing in these? Is that with some intention? Are you, are you working to be these things? Because after all, we bear the name of Christ every place we are. It's important that we're growing in these ways. Sadly, too few take God's word seriously. It's kind of sad because all of us are going to be judged by it someday. The truth in the book, that's what we're measured against. The first question is, do we take the time to study it and understand it? Do we take the time? It's not just going to happen for you. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. But you've got to make time. Do you take time to study and understand it? And granted, we have classes here and study opportunities through the week. And, and you can open the Bible. There's so many resources online today. It's unbelievable to help you understand the Bible. Many of you have access to Right Now Media. There is so much on Right Now Media that will help you teach and learn how to study and how to interpret and look at different books of the Bible, different passages of the Bible. But do we take the time to study it and understand it? And secondly, do we obey it and let it transform us? Or do we just read it? Let's pray. Dear Father, we know that um, you've described your word as a living word. But I'm afraid sometimes we just let it be a book that gathers dust somewhere in our home or a car, a trunk. Some of our Bibles, Father, have never really been opened. They look like they've just come off the store shelf. Others are kind of ratty looking, not because we've studied them so hard, but because we've had them a while and we just... Uh, we do so much with them, but not always studying. And some of our Bibles are well-worn. And there's highlighting on pages, and there's notes taken in the sidelines, and there's study notes and different things that we've done. I'm afraid, Father, we just filled our lives with so many things. We just don't have time to do things like this anymore. We think we don't. And Father, we miss so much. We just kind of sound like the world sometimes. Oh, there's so much in there I just don't understand. I can't, I, you know, I can't, I can't figure that out. I'm not smart enough. 
But Father, there's so much significance in your word and every part of it is there for a reason. We just often don't see it. We don't take time to dig. We're not challenged by it. The Holy Spirit is not illuminating it for us because we're just not taking the time. Father, we want to yield our lives fully to you and this is just another area that we want to do that in a better way. And I just pray, Father, that we understand the priority and the, and the greatness of your word and to realize that your word is the thing we need the most in a world so filled with darkness today. Not only so that your light shines in us, Father, but so that we can minister to people and show them Jesus through the lives that we live, through our obedience, through our faith and our trust, through our kindness and our consideration of them. Oh, Lord, we want to be all those things. And we know you'll help us. We'll turn to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, if you have um, never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. We realize the Bible calls us to a, a life of belief and a life of repentance, which is just another way of saying that I'm turning my back on the sins that lead me away from God to begin walking toward Him with every day I have. I'm willing to confess Him and be one of His children and be loyal to Him. And I'm willing to be immersed. And I'm willing to let my life be buried in the waters of baptism that I might come forth from that a new person filled with the Holy Spirit sins all forgiven and begin living that life for Jesus and perfect though I will be I'll begin living for him with all I have the baptistry is ready today it's first Sunday of the month we always fill it up on the first Sunday and we're more than happy to talk to you about that today if you've never done that Holy Spirit is leading your heart to that kind of decision we're also happy if you're looking for a church home we'd love to have you as part of the family here at Kenwood Heights I'd love to talk to you about that as well some of you may feel ready for a public decision. I'll be down here as we sing the next song to greet you if that's the situation you're in. I'll also be in the back following the service along with some of the other folks that are leaders with badges to talk to you in private about your decision and your questions, to pray with you, whatever that needs to be. We just want to be of help to you and the Lord Jesus today as we move forward. So we'll be standing together. If you'd like to come publicly, I'm here today to talk to you. If you'd like to talk to us later, that's fine as well.